what are the top three nutrient deficiencies that I see in adults over 40? I've had the absolute privilege of looking at over hundreds of blood tests now for men and women over the age of 40 across Australia, New Zealand, and even into Canada. And this you know, exposure to a lot of different blood results has really started to show me some trends with some key nutrients that are commonly low but maybe not being tested. And they're nutrients that I think of are, are of a lot of concern because they're nutrients that are related to longevity, health, how well we age, and just health status in general. So when clients come into the Body Reset program, we do a full list of blood testing for them. And the reason we do this is so that rather than just looking at the individual and generalizing what might be good for them, we can actually look under the hood a little bit and see what nutrients are low for them, what systems in their body maybe need a little bit more support and how can we then address that through you know um, nutrition advice or movement advice or supplemental advice etc to really meet the individual and when we do this and then we look at the bloods and we talk through them with the client often there's quite a lot of surprise about these three nutrients maybe being lower than what they expected because for a lot of people, they actually feel like they are doing the things required to have these levels in an appropriate kind of space. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk through these today because they might surprise you a little bit and just give you a little bit of nuance on what these might look like for you. So the first one we're going to talk about is vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin. Now, you know, we live in Australia and New Zealand, right? And pretty sunny country so you wouldn't think that this is necessarily low for us but you would be absolutely surprised especially at this time of year just where these levels might be sitting. So vitamin D is a funny little nutrient. It's, it is classified as a vitamin, but it actually kind of straddles this line between vitamin and potentially a hormone, which is super intriguing. And it has many uses in the body, but the main one that's, that it's mainly known for is that it helps our intestinal lining absorb calcium. So it has a real direct impact on bone health. And if your levels are not adequate enough, then what happens is, is your bones are gonna start releasing calcium to meet the other calcium needs in the body and over time this is going to deteriorate the strength and quality of your bone. So vitamin D is really important for bone health and that of course has a lot of ties into longevity as well but vitamin D has a lot of other uses that perhaps it's less known for and one of those is around modulating immune function. So there's actually a correlation between chronically low vitamin D levels and a higher risk of developing autoimmune conditions and even through COVID and stuff it was known that you know people with a lower vitamin D status tended to be more likely to get a virus it was maybe going to be you know more infect you know worse presentation at the time and take longer to recover from because vitamin D has this beautiful role of just modulating immune response and what that means is helps us to have an appropriate immune response to any type of thing. Um, and vitamin D has another role, and that is that it's really, really important for insulin sensitivity. And in a world where you know we have this rising kind of epidemic of what is under the umbrella term metabolic syndrome, insulin sensitivity is something we should all take very seriously because it is one of those chronic conditions that develops as we age and has an impact on quality of life. So what's the issue here with vitamin D is that we get it from the sun, right? So we all feel like we should have enough of it. And this is part of why it's not tested because we think, well, we get enough of it. But there's a lot of processes that can go wrong in the, in the conversion of sunlight into vitamin D. That is, you have to get the exposure to the UVB rays in the first place. You have to have enough cholesterol because your cholesterol is what is converted into vitamin D. That then gets taken to your liver and converted into another substance and that substance is what shows up on a vitamin D blood test and then that then has to go to the kidneys and be converted into what is actually active vitamin D that is used by your body. So you can see there's many steps in the process to take sunlight and actually have adequate vitamin D levels. And the issue is here is that there could be a break in any one of those systems. So maybe you get enough sunlight but your liver's focused on dealing with too much alcohol or dealing with too much fatty infiltration if you've got um, metabolic issues and fat, fatty liver or something. Or maybe your kidneys aren't doing so good and you're not activating that vitamin D appropriately. So there's many places that the system can break and 
I think also what a lot of people don't realise is New Zealand sits pretty far down on the globe, right? Where most of New Zealand is below like 37 degrees south of the equator. And if you're 37 degrees south or 37 degrees north of, then you're kind of in the zone where we don't really get adequate UVB exposure to really produce an appreciable amount of vitamin D through the middle months of the year when our days are shorter. So for a lot of New Zealand, we're just actually not getting enough of it. Now, vitamin D would be the probably the nutrient that I probably get the most pushback on when it comes to actually getting it tested. And part of that is because it's not you know, it's not considered to be a nutrient of concern because we do have good sunshine hours. But the other part of it is that the reference range in Australia and New Zealand is very broad. So we have a range that goes from about 50 through to 150 to give you some numbers. And so anything under 50 would be considered a, a nutrient deficiency. And if your doctor tested and got that, they would possibly give you a prescription for vitamin D. But most people don't fall that low. Most people sort of fit in the 50 to 75 kind of range. And other, if you kind of dig more into the research, you'll find that actually anything below 75 actually has some detrimental effect on your bone health. And so a lot of people are sitting in this kind of subclinical deficiency state and it's not getting picked up because it's not falling outside of that normal range. It's below optimal, but it's not outside of normal. And I think, you know, when this has such a significant impact on the quality of life, on how we're going to age, it's worth doing that test and getting your baseline and then addressing it if it is low because it's not hard to do and it's not hard to correct if it is too low. So the issue here really is that the, the reference range holds us back from testing it. Which kind of takes me into the next vitamin, which I see really, really low or nutrient, and that is vitamin B12. And I have a real interest in B12 because there is a strong correlation with low levels of B12 and the increased risk of cognitive decline as we age. And a lot of the people that I talk to are in the age bracket where they have aging parents and they're starting to see things like dementia, things like Alzheimer's, things like memory loss and those sorts of things take hold in their parents and there's a lot of fear there you know it's the one thing that I would say is the biggest thing that people are afraid of aging is that loss of mental and um, brain function and b12 is strongly implicated in this because b12 is needed for the turnover repair and maintenance of our nerves our nervous system and our brain cells and it's also a nutrient which is commonly not tested because we think we get enough of it but when we're looking at b12 it's really important to understand we have wanted to look at this through a couple of lenses we want to look at it through intake uptake and losses so we're just going to go through those briefly for b12 so when it comes to intake of b12 it only comes from animal foods there is some algae that has some b12 in it and then another food that's commonly kind of touted in sort of the vegan or vegetarian space is nutritional yeast but that's actually fortified with b12 it's not naturally occurring b12 only b12 occurs in animal products and we can't make it some of the bacteria in our gut can make a small amount but not enough so we have to get it from the food we eat so the first question is, are you eating enough of the foods that actually provide enough for your body? And what your body needs might be different to what someone else's body needs. So are you eating enough for you, firstly? Are you eating in a way that you're actually able to extract the B12 from the food that you're eating? Because if you're eating partially and, and swallowing partially chewed foods and you don't have good kind of mindful eating practices then you might be limiting the amount of b12 you're actually getting out of the good foods you're eating anyway and then we look at uptake maybe you're eating enough but are you actually absorbing it and that comes down to the level of your stomach acid and the level of your digestive enzymes and how well your digestive process is working so if you've got a lot of gut issues going on or had anything like inflammatory bowel conditions or use of antacid medications which reduce your stomach acidity or have chronic diarrhea or those sorts of things then your ability to uptake the b12 might not be as good as it should be so you might be getting enough but not absorbing enough and then the other part of the picture here is actually losses so b12 has this role in nerve function and cognitive function and memory consolidation and retention and all that sort of stuff but it also has a really important role in the formation of red blood cells and red blood cells are obviously how we oxygenate our tissue how we 
or produce energy in the body and when you lose blood you lose b12 as well so what about losses so losses could be from digestive issues such as diarrhea for example but losses could also be from heavy menstrual cycle or or blood loss in some other way so that's what we want to look at with b12 is intake uptake and potential losses and the issue with the b12 very similar to the vitamin d is it's not tested very often because not many people fall outside of the range which is considered to be normal now in new zealand our range to give you some numbers is about 170 to 600 and then 110 is borderline so there's kind of like this edge category where depending on the doctor depending on the person looking at it will decide whether that's too low or not so some people could be under 170 and not be treated for low b12 others might be under and they are but when you look into the research and there's been some research on kind of cognitive decline and low b12 levels their cutoff is closer to about 270 so if you're under 270 you're considered to be deficient in b12 so what about the people that are lower than that but they haven't fallen outside of range yet you know in, in new zealand australia those people aren't even getting treated or or checked and then if you dig a bit further you find that like japan and some european countries have a different range altogether and anything below 370 for them is considered to be too low so you can see how a lot of our population can actually be in that marginally low space where they're absolutely not optimal but they haven't yet fallen out the bottom of the bucket to the point where they're actually being offered a b12 jab or something to correct the issue so when it comes to B12, if you're gonna get this tested, the one thing I would say is ask for the number. Don't just sit there at, yeah, it's enough, or yeah, you're in the normal range. I want to know the number. I want to know where in that range I am, so if I know that I'm close to the top end, or if I'm close to the bottom, because I wanna be doing something about it long before I'm anywhere near the bottom. Because the thing with B12 is that if you're in a deficiency state, your body will, the symptoms don't show up until the damage has been done. You know, neuropathy and the, the brain and mental decline and stuff like that don't show up until some sort of damage has been done and that's not always correctable with more of that nutrient after the fact so you want to be addressing it before it happens let's move on to my last one my last one's a little bit different and it is zinc and the reason zinc is different to vitamin d and b12 is that there's not really a good blood test for this one so you can test levels in your blood but all minerals but zinc in particular is a very very tightly controlled mineral in your blood and that is because the role of zinc in the body is not in the blood the role of zinc in the body is in the tissue doing the work and so the levels in your blood it's just the trafficking of zinc from place to place, from digestive system to the places where it's needed. And so it's very much maintained within quite a strict kind of range. So if you blood test, you're always gonna see relatively normal. And this, this raises a lot of issues with actually understanding the statistics around zinc deficiency across the world because it's not there's no good way to measure it because someone's blood levels are always gonna be relatively stable. So with zinc, we're kind of looking at more, well, what does it do? And zinc has a role in like 300 different chemical reactions within the body it's a very important nutrient for a whole lot of different things and some of those give us some little indicators and connections when we start seeing symptoms coming up so zinc one of zinc's most important functions is it is part of our stomach acid so it's required to make stomach acid why that's important is that you need stomach acid to get every other nutrient out of your food so low levels of zinc can be the reason why you can't maintain other nutrient levels and ironically low levels of zinc could actually be why you have low zinc because it becomes a little bit of a compounding snowballing issue if your zinc's low you can't make the stomach acid meaning you can't get the zinc out of your foods zinc's also really important for blood sugar control because it's needed by the pancreas to make and release insulin so if there's blood sugar issues going on there is actually a correlation in the literature to show that there's more of a connection of low zinc levels with people that develop type 2 diabetes and whatnot Zinc is also important for testosterone production, for thyroid production, for so many different things in our body. And I think it's one of those ones where the symptoms, because it's involved in so many different things, the symptoms are so vast. So a couple of things you could be looking for and, and asking for with zinc, because we can't test for it, would be, you know, am I prone to infections? Do I get sick a lot more, maybe, than I used to? If I get a wound, is it very slow to heal? Do I have digestive issues or perhaps developing allergies that I never used to have before? 
or you know there's a whole lot of different things that could be showing up here a loss of smell and um, taste can be a sign of zinc deficiency as well your hair falling out there can be so many different things that are connected to zinc because it has a role in so many different functions so when it comes to getting enough zinc we want to be looking at again much like the b12 intake uptake and losses so intake of zinc is what foods are we having that it's in now zinc zinc is in actually quite a lot of different foods it is best absorbed from animal foods because animal foods often don't have the phytates or plant components that tend to bind up zinc in our digestive process in, um, system so from um, shellfish is your best source oysters in particular and then red meat lamb and beef are really good sources and then eggs and dairy etc and then moving into like your nuts and seeds and plants and whatnot as well but just being aware that the bioavailability of the zinc in those plant sources is going to be less because of the binding components that are in the plant as well. So we really want to be looking at one, is our diet adequate? Are we getting enough? And this is what, you know, this ties back so much to just our general daily habits. Are we eating nutrient dense food? Because it's not just about calories. It's not just about, is this enough, you know, carbohydrates, protein and fat for me, but it is this a nutrient dense source of food that's supplying all these micronutrients as well as the macronutrients we need to function well. And then we want to look at uptake and again we come back to what's your digestive system doing? Are you chewing well? Do you have good stomach acid, good digestive enzymes? Are you taking antacids all the time? Because if you are and you're turning down your stomach acid production, in the long term, you're going to have a flow on effect to how your mineral status across the board, magnesium, B12, zinc, all of those things, are going to potentially end up a bit deficient because you don't have the stomach acidity there to get that nutri- um, those nutrients out of your food. And then losses, and losses again could be you know, all sorts of different things, whether it's um, chronic diarrhea or bowel issues or blood loss, etc. We want to be paying attention to those as well. So... You know, when it comes to nutrition in general, we have to have that overarching thing of just quality of food and looking at all of that. But then we want to be digging a little bit deeper and actually looking to some of these key nutrients as well, because there is, you know, becoming much stronger links with low vitamin D and, you know, bone health or autoimmune conditions and low B12 and cognitive decline or low zinc and just general lower quality of health overall. And they're really simple things to address if we really pay attention to what's going on talked a bit throughout this about kind of those normal or abnormal or optimal blood levels and I've actually done a full training on this as well just kind of digging a bit deeper into some of the nuance of how that range is developed and how we can get you know I guess make the most of what we're getting when we're getting some blood tests done so if you want to look at that just um, comment blood work below or if you're watching this on YouTube it'll be linked down below but give that a watch if this has raised some questions for you if you've had some blood work done and you want to kind of look at it and read them a little bit differently that might be helpful for you but hopefully that was interesting get your vitamin d checked get your b12 checked pay attention to your zinc status because those are things that are really going to impact you know health in general and health in the long run as well hopefully helpful have a great day guys see you later